17 um, scholarship engagement and collaboration pillar. Today we're going to be hosting three psychologists, three paths, exploring career options. Our three panelists are Dr. Sharon Bowman, who is the professor and chair in the counseling psychology department at Ball State University. Um, if you want to wave Dr. Bowman or Yep. <laughs> uh, we've also got Dr. Lena Burkhart, who is the practicum clinic director at Ball State University as well. Um, and then finally, we've got Dr. Leroy Reese, um, and he is a research associate professor for community health and preventive medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine. And myself, my name is Samantha Henningkamp, and I'm a first year student um, wrapping up my first year in the doctoral program at Ball State. I'm Hope Covington. I'm a second year master's student at Ball State. I'm wrapping up my um, master's degree as well. Um, and I'm gonna, Sam and I will be facilitating the webinar. So we're very excited about the turnout today. Um, grateful y'all could join us. Um, just to briefly orient you to what to expect today, um, we're gonna get started by having each of the panelists speak for about 10 minutes, and they're going to share pertinent information about their career path. Um, at that point, once all three have spoken, we're going to field questions from the audience. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and use that chat box option to type in. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be checking it periodically, but we're gonna wait to answer questions until the very end. Um, feel free to send them in though at any time. And if you have a question specifically for one or two panelists, um, you can note that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Bowman to begin sharing about her career path. Thank you, Sam and Hope. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I tend to ramble on about my career path in lots of different ways, so I will try to rein this version in just a bit. I am a counseling psychologist. I have known since I was 13 I was going to be a psychologist. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I knew I would be a psychologist. By the time I was 17, in my senior year of high school, I decided I would be a counseling psychologist versus a clinical psychologist, because in my naive high school brain, I thought counseling psychologists worked with normal people and clinical psychologists worked with crazy people, and I wanted to work with normal people. So I stayed on that path throughout my academic training. I did learn, just to be clear, that counseling psychologists and clinical psychologists differ more in worldview than they do in the types of people that they choose to work with. So I, I want to make that very clear. My undergraduate is in psychology from The Ohio State University. My master's is in counseling psychology from the University of Akron. My doctorate is in counseling psychology from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And I did my internship at the University of Delaware's Counseling Center. So I spent and continue to spend most of my life here in the Midwest with a one year trip out to the East Coast to find out what it was like to live somewhere other than one of the Midwestern states. I, as I said, I always knew I would be a psychologist and I pretty much always knew I would be a counseling psychologist. What I thought I would be doing with that degree changed over time. Initially, I thought I would be in private practice. By the time I started in my, my undergraduate program, I thought I would be in community mental health. By the time I started my master's program, I was still thinking community mental health and had a bit of a thought about corrections work. When I hit my doctoral program, I decided it would be university counseling centers. So I was always planning a clinical type career. It was just a question of where I was going to be working. With all of that though, I was trained to do anything I could possibly want to do with this degree. I always did research. I taught classes as a TA in my master's program. I taught classes throughout my doctoral program. I did all sorts of outreach with women's groups during the doctoral program, did all kinds of clinical work, mostly in university counseling centers in the doctoral program, but I did lots of different clinical options. 
was involved in professional networking and professional um, associations. I think I did my first conference presentation at the American College Personnel Association. In my first year of the doctoral program, I did my first APA presentation the year after that. So I've always had all of those pieces, all of those, I can do anything I want to do. I'm going to try it all out approaches. But I always thought I would wind up in a clinical position. My first job out of school happens to be here at Ball State, the job that I currently hold as a faculty member. I came here thinking, okay, yeah, I can do this. My primary motivation for becoming an academician and probably the primary foundation for a lot of what I do in my, my career has been if I don't put myself out there and say I'm willing to try it, I can't complain if there's no one who looks like me who's doing whatever it is that needs to be done. My parents raised me to not wait until somebody else did whatever. If I wanted to do it, I needed to go out and do it. Just go be the pioneer and take care of it. So as an academician, I realized I had not had an African-American faculty member until my doctoral program uh, and the person who was hired came in after I started there. So he was not one of my direct faculty. But I knew that I couldn't complain that there were no African-American faculty available if I was not willing to at least try it. So I became a faculty member here at Ball State, thinking I would be here for two years. This is now year 29. And in that time, I've directed the doctoral program. I have um, done all sorts of things teaching-wise in both our master's program, our doctoral program, and our undergraduate minor in interpersonal relations. So I've gotten to teach all sorts of classes. I have mentored students in a variety of ways. I continue to do lots of professional development in lots of different ways. And I have been the chair of this academic department for, well, I just started my 23rd year as department chair. I am currently the longest serving current department chair at our university. I was the first African American department chair. I was not the first female, but I was the first African American department chair here. So I, I continue to do lots of different firsts and to keep my finger in lots of different ways to serve as a model. On top of that, I do also still have a private practice. I see clients one day a week. I use my practice to keep my skills up and I use it as an example and it gives me lots of opportunities to talk about practice work when I'm training my own students in their master's and doctoral practicums. I don't know how I'm doing on time, Sam. You've got about three minutes if you want to keep chatting. Three minutes, okay. In those three minutes, unexpected aspects of my career path. Um, probably becoming department chair. The thing I tell people often, well, that's one of the, the pieces. The thing I tell people that they usually don't believe is that I'm an introvert by nature. I tend to sit back, my style of interacting is to sit back and watch, study the process. When I decide to say something, it's because I've been paying attention and I figured out where I wanna go and what I wanna do. I'm not the chattiest person in the room, but don't assume I'm not paying attention. So for someone who is very much an introvert by nature to spend her time talking to people all day long and then to decide to take leadership roles has been particularly funny to other people. So I've been department chair. I, have, I am a past president of Division 17, the Counseling Psychology Division of APA. I am currently the president-elect of the American Board of Counseling Psychology, which is the ABEP board 
for counseling psychologists, and I serve on the ABEP Board of Trustees. So I have my finger in lots of pots that put me in leadership roles. Again, the piece for me all the way through is how can I model for other people that they can do this? If I can do it, then you can certainly find yourself doing it. I strongly recommend you never say never because you could be surprised at what you'll find yourself doing one day. I think with that, I'll probably stop. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Bowman. Um, Dr. Burkhart, would you like to um, share next? Sure, can you guys hear me okay? Great, so um, thank you, Sam and Hope, for organizing this. Um, it's always, um, I was honored that you all asked me to participate and be a part of it. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll start from, from the beginning of uh, my educational career, but I'll say I, I always knew I wanted you know, um, to help and serve, serve others. Um, what shape or form that would take, um, I, I wasn't 100% certain. Um, I started off at West Point at a military academy. Um, so you can see where um, I did not graduate from there, I should say that. Um, I left there after a short period of time. I probably should have been somewhere like the Peace Corps, quite honestly. We won't get into how I ended up at West Point. <laughs> um, but then I um, ended up getting my undergraduate from West Virginia Wesleyan College and, um, you know, really had some key professors there that I think really helped point me or I know um, into what shape it would take for me to you know, my career to wanting to serve others and wanting to be a psychologist. Um, I played basketball in college and we would travel a lot and um, I remember there was a learning and memory class and um, I was going to miss it and um, one of the professors when I came back to talk to him he set up a time for me to meet and um, sat down for about two hours and retaught the whole lecture to me and it really um, their passion and commitment um, to my growth and education just really touched me and I was so hungry and eager and they really nurtured that and helped to um, help me kind of figure out from a graduate school perspective where to go. In hindsight, I'll be honest with you, I realized I was pretty clueless. Um, everything worked out the way it should and I feel like um, I have not a single regret about being a clinical psychologist. Um, but honestly, I was pretty clueless about what all the various options were for me um, from a career standpoint and what shape that could take other than being a clinical psychologist. Um, I entered into a BA to PhD program um, at the University of Virginia. I um, got a master's degree in education and clinical, and, um, pardon me, in school and educational psychology. Um, the program, University of Virginia had two different programs. Uh, one through the psychology department and one through the Curry programs in clinical and school psychology. Um, so that program, your master's degree was in education, um, and then a PhD in clinical psychology. And um, thankfully um, had just, again, some wonderful mentors um, that I feel like really helped to nurture um, me and shape uh, kind of the, the future directions I was to go in and, um, fuel my passions. Um, so I ended up going to um, University of Miami, the Melman Center for Child Development for my internship. Um, I've always known I wanted to work with children and families, um, low income, at risk, uh, high risk populations. And that's always been a common thread um, throughout. So at the Melman Center for Child Development, I um, had some outpatient work, integrated care, um, also was um, got an opportunity to do some inpatient um, uh, clinical services uh, in pediatric psychology. I was in a multivisceral transplant unit, um, which was pretty amazing um, to be a part of that, that team and working with um, those young children and their families. And then um, also there, um, they had a perinatal um, chemical addictions and research program or healthy start program um, where I was able to work with moms um, who had tested who had given birth and their babies had tested positive for some sort of substance at birth and so I did baby and me groups um, I got to um, try out in-home visits and work and if you've never done in-home work um, that'll shape you right there um, wonderful fantastic experience 
Um, and then that developed into a postdoc um, through that program, really focused on in infant mental health, which was um, my dissertation was related to early parent-child attachment relationships. So it was great to be able to go from the research side to the clinical work with that population. Um, then after that, I was just thrilled to be done, quite honestly. I had been fortunate enough to um, get a Head Start grant, had taken an extra year in graduate school before I went on internship so that I could uh, work on that grant, finish my dissertation before I went on internship. Um, so in 2003, um, I graduated. I've been licensed since 2005. I was really tired of being poor um, and broke and um, ended up, um, at that time, had the flexibility to go wherever I wanted to go in the country. Um, I didn't have restrictions. My partner and I was just really, where would we like to live? And so from a career standpoint, that was pretty neat to just look at various jobs around the country and um, decide um, where I wanted to end up and um, geographically and professionally. So I ended up working um, at a primary care practice, pediatric primary care practice. And as one of their staff psychologists, there was one other psychologist there. And we're basically in-house psychologists, um, taking referrals from the pediatricians and um, doing everything from psychological and psychoeducational evaluations, outpatient um, counseling, individual therapy, family therapy, and um, consultations with the pediatric providers. I was there about five years and probably one of the things that um, kind of quickly I noticed is family started to be a pretty big um, decision in my career path and um, trying to figure out how to balance um, having my doctor hat on, Dr. Lena, Dr. B, and having the, the mama hat. And so after about being there for five years, uh, we decided that it would be best for my family to go into private practice. I never, private practice was nothing I was ever, I, I, I never envisioned myself in private practice, quite honestly. Um, largely, you know, for someone who's wanting to work with low-income populations, as you can guess, private practice is not where you're going to find a lot of those folks. Um, so it, it was a big decision for me to um, decide to go that route. Um, but for my family's sake and having the flexibility to be able to make my own schedule, take off when I need it or not, um, it worked out really well. And um, I just continued to see a couple patients, um, well, more than a couple in the beginning, um, what, regardless of their ability to pay, kind of as my way to give back while also working with that you know, typical kind of private practice. Um, financially, I should say, typical um, population, folks who had commercial insurance or could pay out of pocket. And then after about five years doing that, um, family again um, and financial, having uh, significant student loans resulted in trying to figure out some other options and ended up moving to um, Indiana, where my uh, husband is from. And I was the director of behavioral health at a community health center. Um, that was a federally qualified health center, patient center, medical home um, facility, and um, nonprofit organization. Very, very different um, from some of my other experiences. Um, I was there for about a year and a half, and part of being there, I got to supervise some wonderful Ball State University graduate students and uh, found something new that I was like really enjoying and felt um, I, uh, students keep me on my toes, um, had me thinking about things in different ways, um, an energy that I desperately needed in a nonprofit setting where a lot of people had been there for a really long time, didn't have that same energy and passion. Um, so was there for about a year and a half and then this uh, current position as clinic director opened up Again, never would have guessed I end up at a university, quite honestly. Um, I've joked around and said this is the only position I'm qualified to do at the whole university. And <laughs> there's only been, I think, three clinic directors prior to me. Um, so it's just, uh, I, I think, where I'm supposed to be, the fact that it, it even opened up and was available when, again, this is pretty much the only position I think I'm qualified for here. Um, and um, it's been... I've been here for almost a year now, and um, I think my time is about up. 
um, but I can kind of weave in a little bit more um, talking about my current position, but it has been uh, a really um, unexpected but a nice fit for me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Burkhart, um, for sharing. Um, and finally, Dr. Reese, if you're ready, we, we're ready to hear you. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, and uh, again, much like my colleagues, thank you for uh, having me uh, here today. I know it's, it took some logistical uh, magic to make this happen, but um, I'm glad to be here. So thank you, Hope, and thank you, thank you Sam. It also kind of brings my world kind of full circle in that uh, I didn't realize who the panelists were until last week. Um, and, and so actually one of my professors, uh, that wouldn't be Lena, uh, uh, Dr. Bowman um, uh, was instrumental in my professional development and um, during my tenure at, at, at Ball State. Um, and, and so I, I think you were about a first year professor uh, maybe a second year professor uh, when I was a graduate student. We'll come back to that later. Um, around uh, how I got here, uh, you know, my first introduction to psychology uh, was sitting on the couch of Dr. Linda Hatton when I was a teenager because I was kind of a knucklehead. And, uh, you know, my mom being who she is, uh, so we're going to figure this out and, and kind of get you headed in the right direction, which was able to happen. Um, and I never thought that I would uh, kind of come back to that. Um, uh, Dr. Hagen was, was somebody, she was one of my earliest mentors in the field of psychology about what it meant to invest in the well-being of someone and to, and to believe in them and their potential. Um, but that stopped there, and it was probably a four or five year pause before I would think about psychology again. So unlike uh, Dr. Bowman, I was not somebody who thought I was going to be um, a psychologist. When I, when I got to undergrad and I finished my undergrad at the College of Worcester, I was, I was also an athlete, football player. Um, and, and, and initially kind of uh, that was my focus. And then everything around that from philosophy to literature, et cetera, um, uh, were the kinds of things I was, I was thinking about. It was an internship at, uh, Boys Village, which is a, a, a facility, residential facility for boys in Smithville, Ohio, um, that changed my world, uh, allowed me to um, see firsthand young lives impacted by trauma and the good work that people who were committed to helping and supporting and nurturing these young people were doing with them. Um, it, it was the piece that made me begin to think um, about working with young people. I, I still don't think that I was in the psychology space and it was um, the, the counsel of a, um, a professor of mine, Dr. Scott, during my undergrad, he said, well, maybe you should think about psychology. At that point, I was uh, thinking about pediatrics, but I also knew that I wanted to do research. I, even then, I enjoyed research and, and knew I wanted that to be part of what I did later in life. And um, Unbeknownst to me at the time that Pediatricians, there are these things called MDs and MPHs or MD PhDs, but that notwithstanding, um, uh, really began to think hard about psychology, declared a major in psychology. Um, and between that and a, and a black psychology course that I took, um, kind of was hooked. Um, that course put my experience of being an African American in this country at the center of how I thought about myself and, and, and my behavioral health in my mental health. So from College of Worcester, um, went to, to Ball State and, and got a master's degree there. And, and from there, uh, went to uh, Ohio State where I got my doctorate. Um, I, I think that one of the things that I became much more acutely aware of during my graduate training was that current behavioral health and mental health systems were not built for communities of color in particular, and, and in particular for me, they were not built for the African-American community. Um, that historically, those systems have been used to marginalize and to pathologize, et cetera. Um, but it had helped me. And, 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 and so I knew what 
psychology could be. I knew what psychologists could do. Um, and, and, and so began to think then differently about what it meant for me to be a psychologist. Added to that is my internship. I did my internship at the Institute for Juvenile Research in Chicago, which is a child clinical internship. And it, it was fascinating um, in that I was doing clinical work in under-resourced communities, um, almost exclusively uh, with African-Americans and Latinos, and then doing research. There's a significant research component uh, to, to the internship, which is part of why I selected it. Um, and, and so I was doing research in these same communities. And, 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 and so my research, which what I refer to then as prevention practice, um, I now think more about as health promoting, um, began to help me understand that there was a different way to think about applied service. And my ability to help people in my therapy office um, versus working in the communities where we were building the resources within the communities where we were um, kind of building capacity um, and sustainability for programs and interventions that we found effective um, just just had me. It, just, I, it, it was a way to roll up your sleeves uh, where people knew you as Roy or as Reese and not by Dr. Reese. I and mean, you were part of the community um, and, and, and part of a resource that that community both learned from and invested in. Uh, it, 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 it would be an understatement um, to try to quantify how much my work in communities has affected me as a psychologist, as a professional, um, but also as a father, husband, um, and just how I think of myself as a human being in the world. Um, so, I went from my training at IJR to uh, my first academic position, which was at Chicago State, um, which doesn't have HBCU status, but is an institution then of about 11,000. It's much bigger now, uh, but it was about 95% African American. Um, and, and what we would typically think of as a non traditional student populace. But I learned how to teach there. Um, and I learned how to learn some more because I, I, I was. You're only a good uh, teacher if you can teach people what you know in a way that they understand it. Um, so your degrees really don't matter. And so this really stretched me um, in some really incredible ways. But it also taught me in some incredibly valuable ways as well in that uh, these folks were also um, teaching me about life and about the work that I want to do and, and teaching me things that, that my coursework had not taught me. Um, and so I went from from Chicago State to the Centers for Disease Control, um, which was again a game changer for me, and in, in which I learned about the fields of public health and preventive medicine, which I didn't know a whole lot about kind of prior to. Um, my professional spaces now are less in the psychological spaces, but I do more in public health and more in preventive medicine. Um, because one of the things that, given my focus on community health, that I've learned is that. Psychology is an important piece, but it's one of multiple pieces about how we promote well-being in, in communities. And so that work there was also very exciting, um, but also very politicized. And so as a federal employee, that one of the things I learned is the work that you got to do or didn't get to do was oftentimes a function of who was in the White House. Um, and, and, and so I had the, the, the pleasure, really, of serving through two different administrations but that influenced my work in some, some interesting ways. Um, I left the CDC because the other thing I learned about CDC is I didn't like uh, middle management. I had become a section chief and uh, trying to manage PhDs and MDs. Well, that's another webinar. And uh, <laughs> uh, my, my very short uh, management career took another, took another turn. Um, presently, I'm at Morehouse School of Medicine. And actually, I sit in the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity which is an awesome place because it has afforded me um, two amazing opportunities. Um, one, to work with my colleague and our senior director, Dr. Wren, but really to work very closely with uh, David Satcher, our, our prior surgeon general. Uh, and, you know, the kind of things I think about as being critical to being a psychologist, one of which is mentorship. 
Um, and, and this is a, is, is a man much like Dr. Bowman and other folks in my life who has invested in me and taught me about my responsibility to invest in other folks as well as, as, well as to serve. And so I'm positive I am at the end of my time. I'm, I'm hoping that I have a couple of the comments I'd like to share, but hope that they'll come up um, during our question and answer period. So again, thanks for having me and uh, sharing. It's good to see you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reese. Um, just to, you know, very briefly recap, um, Dr. Bowman spoke, you know, a bit about her passion from an early age and how she just sort of knew that this is where she was going, although she didn't quite know where the path led to. She knew the path. Um, Dr. Burkhart, um, speaking about specializing with infants and children uh, with, with her studies and going on to a host of different clinical positions. Um, I didn't realize you had so many different types of clinical settings. So that was really neat to learn about. Um, Self-disclosure, Dr. Burkhart is my clinic director, so it's been fun. And of course, Dr. Bowman is my uh, department chair and cognate chair, so it's been fun to learn about her as well. Uh, Dr. Reese, um, of such immersive experiences um, from what you're sharing of, with prevention practice or self-promotion, like you mentioned, and as well as the research, um, that's the part that really stuck out to me is that and a deep connection to the community you work with, um, as well as a host of different careers in a different vein, um, several different research positions. Wonderful. Um, so at this time, we're going to switch gears a bit um, to the question and answer section. And so I'm going to turn the microphone open over to Hope to um, propose the first question for our panelists. So I'm going to be fielding questions. Um, as we go through questions, feel free to share any questions that you have in the chat window, um, and we will get to those. So the first question we have for our panelists is, um, what are some of the most rewarding parts of your job, as well as some of the most challenging? And anyone can answer that. My guess is that my colleagues would agree with this because we are all working in academic settings of some nature right now. The most rewarding part of my job is when I have a student have an aha moment. When I have a student who has been struggling with something who has the, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know if I can finish, uh, some piece of life has gotten in the way. And when I can see a student who has the potential actually reach for that potential and have that aha, oh wait, I get it, I can do this, that makes my day. That can make my year. So if I've been having a, one of my questioning moments of, is this really what I want to keep doing? I could just leave academia and go into private practice and life would be okay. When I have those moments with my students, that's what reminds me why I do what I do. Probably the most challenging part of my career goes back to something Dr. Reese also said. There's a, there's a magic to being middle management that it can be exhausting sometimes when you really are the face on both sides. So as a department chair, I am the face for my students and my faculty in going to the administration or going anywhere publicly. I am also the face of the administration when it comes to bringing things back to my faculty and students. So I kind of find myself in middle management and sometimes that aspect of being a professor or being an administrator is not as much fun. Um, and takes a willingness to kind of slog through things from time to time. Universities don't move very quickly. They don't move as quickly as we would like for them to. Those are probably my two big answers to that question right now. You know, I think that uh, for me, um, so I love what I do. Um, and, and that is the, the coolest part of, of my day. Um, one of the things I didn't say when, as I was talking is that I, I have a foot in the research space, a research, foot in the policy space, and a foot in the clinical space. And, and so I work primarily clinically with uh, African American adolescent males. Uh, and it is their aha moments. 
is they're uh, embracing kind of all that is good and special about who they are that is the thing that um, uh, that I celebrate uh, the most. This time of year is always really cool for me because um, it's, it's graduation time. And, and, and so um, I've gotten a little longer the tooth, I guess, in that um, I had a handful of young men who graduated from college this year. Um, each of these men, young men, had their own story of uh, demonstrating resilience uh, to, to be where they are. And, uh, what was cool for me is that even though I'm not in contact with some of them, that several of them reached back, sent pictures, graduation photos, and cards. Um, and, and so it's always good to feel like you're doing something that makes a difference. And so um, that was amazing. I, I think the most frustrating part of my work is the extent to which politics drives what we do and what we don't do. We know, for example, that there is a very direct relation between behavioral and mental health and overall health and well-being. Yet, I have kids who have to go to prison um, in order to see a psychiatrist or to see a therapist where they got those, that help on the outside that they, they might not be in those circumstances. Or we know things that about what helps um, build sustainable, sustainable um, uh, health in communities and, and, and we'd rather argue um, about uh, dividends um, on our stocks than investing in, in our citizens. And so um, the, one of the more humbling experiences um, uh, is, is to recognize that, that, that politics sometimes and, and the perception of events um, has more to do with what we're able to do than what we're rolling up our sleeves and doing with on a daily basis, and so we have to figure out how to be smarter in these spaces. Thank you for um, sharing about your some of the rewards and challenges that you guys have um, experienced. I think what stood out to me in that is um, the experience of seeing whether students or clients have those moments of success and that's encouraging to hear that's something that's really rewarding for you guys um the next question we want to ask and again this is available for anyone to answer um how do you balance your work responsibilities with your personal life and what kinds of advice do you have for um, students trying to do that uh, all of you have, all the panelists have your, um, are juggling a lot of balls and have a lot of different hats that you wear. So we would love to hear some advice on that. I, I'll chime in some. Um, I, I'm interested to hear what um, other folks are doing as well, because it is a learning process um, and ongoing and how to juggle all of um, different obligations and responsibilities. Um, I, I haven't got it all figured out, but I think I'm getting there um, for sure. Um, I think first a recommendation I would have is that it starts, uh, you know, we talk a lot about self-care. We talk about balancing personal life with, uh, you know, for students, encouraging students to balance that, um, but really making it happen. I think we, you know, I, I question how much we're just talking versus no, you really, you really need to do that. And I really feel like if I would have started uh, more of that early on while I was in graduate school, it would be even easier for me now. Um, my dissertation ruined me. <laughs> I think, you know, always having that hanging over your head, there was always something else to do and accomplish. And um, e even now, sometimes if I'm just on the floor playing with my boys, I feel like, oh, there's something else I'm supposed to be doing. It's like, no, this is what you're supposed to be doing, Lena, right here, right now, being present with your family. Um, so I would encourage people, I mean, you can't say that enough, um, to get those habits in place now as you are developing professionally and not to wait until maybe some of those other family or personal, you know, and those obligations increase. Um, I feel like for me, what, what has been key is um, what choices I'm making professionally about where I'm working. 
Um, not everyone ha can have the flexibility to do that, um, but being able to um, have a type of a position that doesn't have set 100%, these are your hours Monday through Friday and there's no flexibility, um, that has worked really well, being able to have the option if I need to take time to go to something at school or do something personally um, that, that I can do that and have a wonderful um, boss who, uh, Dr. Bowman, who can allow those sort of things and that sort of flexibility um, to happen. While I've worked at other jobs at the community health center that that flexibility was, wasn't there. Um, so I think um, for me, the other thing is when I'm present, I'm present, I'm all out. When I'm here, I'm 100% um, here, going, doing, um, but trying really hard to, for me personally to have boundaries about how much I take home and how much I'm doing at home and when am I doing things at home or not. Um, but I think it evolves and, and there's no right way to do it. It's just being intentional about what works for you personally, your family, um, what other commitments or obligations you have, but just being very intentional about what that looks like and the time that you're dedicating um, to all those different things and making sure you have plenty of time for self-care. I, I would ditto the self-care piece. I, I think that's critical as well as the being intentional. I think that one of the things that happens is that you'll become clear about what's important to you and why. Um, if there was a point in my career where it was not unusual for me to work 12, 15 hour days because I was not a parent I was not uh, married. Um, it was just kind of me. I, I could go as hard as I wanted to go. Um, my most important job now is that of husband and father. And, and so with that shifted my priorities. Um, I don't miss soccer games. In fact, I coach soccer. I don't miss school events. And, and, he's in, and my colleagues just understand that, hey, if it comes to Reese's kids, like he's out because that's what he does. And, and, and I try to prioritize um, my own self-care. Um, my wife wishes I would probably prioritize care of, of us more, but I'm, I'm working on that. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a matter of becoming clear about what's important to you and why. Uh, because, you know, for me, my family really supports what I do. They know that I love what I do. Uh, and if I give it back to them, you know, they, they, they got me, so. The only thing I would add to that is if you are in graduate school, then you know that's a full-time job. There's always something to do. There's always something waiting around the corner. There's always another article to read. There's always some professor who wants something done from you as though you have nothing else to do in your life. There is always that pesky little thesis or that pesky dissertation or that practicum application. There's always something. You're going to wake up with it. You're going to go to sleep with it. If you don't take care of yourself, it will eat your life. So you do have to figure it out now. You Sometimes you just have to allow us as your faculty and your supervisors to take over and look at you and say, no, you don't look well, go home today. Because you won't do it for yourself. Sometimes you have to let us do it for you. That's our way of training you to pay attention to what's important. And I agree with my colleagues. Figure out ways to shut this down. It will always be there. It will always, email will always be there. Just figure out how to shut it down for a few hours. You know what you tell your clients. You tell them to let it go and that if they can walk away from it, they'll come back refreshed and better willing to work. So take your own advice. That's the best thing I can tell you. Thanks for the reminders to um, prioritize self-care. I think one thing that stood out to me from all three of you guys was um, the importance of thinking about priorities um, and really thinking about what the priorities are for yourself at different stages of life. Um, this is going to be our last question and we will wrap up after this, um, but what final advice would you have given to yourself as a grad student that you would like to share with current grad students now? I 
I always allow myself a mental health day. And it goes back to the self-care piece. There was one day every semester that I simply did not go to class. I didn't go to school. It was sort of semi-planned. It wasn't like it was a test day or anything. But there was always a day where I knew I just needed a break. I was very fortunate in doc school that my roommate was also one of my classmates. So we did not take mental health days together, but I knew that I needed them. And as my students have heard me say more than once, come December, every year I was in school, except the year I was applying for internship, I would look around and say, you know what, I don't need this. I could drop out. I would be fine. I have a master's degree. I don't need to continue this craziness. It was said in harsher terms than that, but that was the basic premise. I needed to say it out loud. I needed to know that I could let it go. Obviously, I never did let it go, but I needed to know that I could. That was my way of remembering that I made a choice to do this and that I could do whatever I wanted to do. So my advice to you is figure out what's important to you. Figure out what your why questions are. Why are you doing this? What is it you want to know? What's the big why question? And use that as your foundation for everything else you do. Allow yourself a break periodically because you deserve it and you're going to burn out if you don't. And remember that if you don't get everything done while you're in grad school, as I, you can see by my colleagues' careers, you can always pick something new up later. If you had asked me if I would be working in a private practice seeing adult clients and doing marital counseling, I would have said, no, that's not what I was trained to do in doc school. That's what I do now. Life changes, your career changes. I'm always a counseling psychologist. What I do and how I get paid changes. But at the foundation, I am always a counseling psychologist. So I, I, the, I would have taken my time more in graduate school. Um, when you start your career, reading, staying abreast of what's happening in your field is a luxury. Um, when you uh, are partnered or have a family, it, it becomes even more of a luxury. And I, I think now about courses I would have wanted to take, uh, things um, that I would have wanted to learn. I, I would have, being a student is a blessing. It, it doesn't obviously always feel like that, but this idea of having a space where what you're expected to do is to learn um, as much as you can, as well as you can. Um, and I, I, would, I would encourage folks to embrace that. The goal, obviously, is to get out of school. Don't lose sight of that. Um, but the, 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 the process of learning, um, one, not only take your time and take advantage of that as a student, but I would also say, figure out how that's going to be an ongoing part of your professional identity once you leave school. Um, and enjoy, enjoy the ride. You know, this, this is, you know, I am, you know, both the other panelists talked about connecting with people who were pretty amazing as part of their career trajectory. And that certainly was true to me. So in, enjoy the way in which those people pour and invest in you um, and stay in touch with them. Yeah, I think I'm gonna piggyback off of what um, Dr. Bowman and Dr. Reese, you know, what he just mentioned about enjoying the ride. Um, I, I think if I could, it, could go back myself and recommend it, it wouldn't be changing what I did in any way it would have been changing how present I was for what I was doing um, and my mindset I think it um, was definitely more future oriented about accomplishing this doing this completing this um, versus being present um, for all of it um, and seeing that as truly, I mean, it cliches, right? But um, not the destination, but the journey and not being as focused 
focused on what was to come next from internship and once I'm licensed and once this and once that versus the blessing of being in school and being able to full time um, immerse myself in um, academically and from research standpoint and clinically and like you said, just sitting down and reading a book, <laughs> right? That, that unfortunately is much harder to do, but being able to have that time, you know, full time um, as a student to just really be present for that experience. Um, I just really wish I would have done much, much more of that. Um, and, you know, it, what we've already said, the self-care piece, I can't, I can't say that enough. And I think that just, that ties in though, when you're not as future oriented, but being in the moment and being present and um, which naturally the self-care will become more a part of that if you are focused on what's happening in the right here, um, right now. And I think the, you know, the last part of what Dr. Reese said, I was definitely going to mention too, of staying in touch with people. I really, um, that is something I would do definitely different. Um, I, I was, I was just ready to be done and be a grown up in the sense of um, not as struggling financially and ready to like um, put my big girl pants on and buy a house and, um, feel more independent and in focusing on that I really lost connection and touch with um, some folks at my program that I really wish I would have maintained more of a closer um, contact with so um, I think that's important that while you're you know focusing on what's to come next that you nurture um, those relationships and keep that bridge uh, between the two Thank you so much for sharing your advice for current grad students. Um, and again, for the reminder of um, taking care of ourselves um, and remembering like why we're doing things and prioritizing relationships. So that's a really good reminder when um, people are juggling a lot. <laughs> um, and thank, yeah, thank you to all three of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to um, share your advice and experience with us. Um, I know for myself, it was really inspiring to hear your career journeys and to hear how your um, like personal values and experiences have really driven um, where you've gone professionally. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Yes, I will ditto what Hope said. Thank you so much. Um, you've been wonderful to work with. Um, I think everyone who watched it, watched it with us and who is going to be able to watch it on our website um, is really going to benefit. And I'm, I know I certainly did. I think my main takeaway is a feeling of hope that, um, in a sense, you learn how to do this job and, and be a person in this kind of role. And, it, you know, um, that's hopeful for me as a student and just starting out with it. Uh, so with that, we are going to wrap up our presentation today. Um, again, thank you for joining us, and thank you for our three panelists for presenting. Uh, we hope you have a lovely day. Yeah. Great day. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>